Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There was a a four-year-old boy who was asked to um, give thanks before Christmas dinner one year. So the family members all bowed their heads together in expectation, and he began his prayer thanking God for all of his friends and naming them one by one. And then he thanked God for mommy and daddy and brother and sister and grandma and grandpa and all his aunts and uncles. And then he began to thank God for the food. He gave thanks for the turkey and the dressing and the fruit salad and the cranberry sauce and the pies and the cakes and even the Cool Whip. And then he paused and everyone waited and waited. And after a long silence, the little boy looked up at his mother and asked, if I thank God for the broccoli, won't he know that I'm lying? Last week, we began a new sermon series entitled, Can You Hear Me Now? And in the next couple of weeks, we intend to look at prayer together, how we do it, why we do it, what it is, and what it is not. And we are using as our guide a book by a writer named Anne Lamont, who calls, uh, says that there are three great prayers, help, thanks, and wow, and we've added in two of our own, sorry and yes. We've prayed each of these categories of prayer with a character and story in the Bible in order to help us understand them. So last week, we took a look at the first great prayer, help, and what asking for help through prayer looks like. We encountered Moses and the Israelites as they wandered through the desert, and we heard Moses ask God, why have you done this to me? And we heard God's answer, a sending of help for him and for the Israelites. This week, we turn to the second great prayer that she names, thanks, and we have as our guide a couple of stories. Now, just like I told you with help last week, thanks has a long history in scripture of being one of the great prayers. We only have to turn to today's psalm as an example of that. Psalms of thanksgiving are just as vital in scriptures as are psalms of lament, like the one we read last week. This week's psalm is 118, which reminds us to give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. The psalmist begins and ends his prayer this way, as a reminder to the congregation who would be reading it together of God's great love. In the middle of those two things, he tells a testimony of how God has helped him, giving thanks all throughout for the work that God has done for him. He says, I was pushed hard, but the Lord has helped me. The Lord is on my side, so I do not fear. God has given us light and victory over our enemies. Great is the Lord. Now, I have always struggled with thank you notes. I know that I should do them. I know that they're important. I often buy them and even write in them, but then I somehow miss that last vital step of actually sending them. Sometimes I'll find them already addressed and with a stamp on them years later. In fact, when we got married, uh, we got married the first year, of my, uh, the summer after my first year in seminary, and then Dwight moved out to Indiana with me where I began serving a three-point charge, three really small churches in a small town in Indiana. And when we were packing up that house to move back to Maryland for my first full-time appointment, I found a whole bag of thank you cards from my wedding two years earlier. I mean, I'm just really, I have great intentions, but somehow I missed that last step. The Apostle Paul is an example to all of us of giving thanks. In almost every letter that he writes, he begins it by giving thanks for the community to which he writes and by giving thanks to God. One of my favorite examples of this is from Philippians, which I just read to you. He says to them, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. Because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. I can just imagine that community receiving this letter that begins with thankfulness for them and what an encouragement that must have been for them. Later in the letter, Paul also encourages the community to give thanks in all circumstances, a practice that he knows will benefit them as a community and will benefit them as individuals in their faith. 
Well, I was at camp this week and was uh, working on the sermon in between, you know, taking kids to the climbing wall and worship and Bible study and all that. I was reminded of one more perfect illustration of the power and necessity of this kind of thanks prayer. And it comes from the Gospel of Luke. So I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to explain just a little bit about it. And I think we have it on slides. So this comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, and is in between two stories of Jesus. And this is what it says. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. So this scripture passage um, tells us that Jesus has been traveling between Samaria and Galilee. And if you remember from previous sermons, that's the border between two groups of people who really don't like each other. Like, even more, they basically hate each other. The Jews from Galilee and the Samaritans from Samaria. Jews considered Samaritans to be ethnic and religious half-breeds who perverted the pure race of Jews, and Samaritans thought the same thing of their brethren. So for Jesus to be walking the borderlands between them was basically like walking the fence line that separated the Hatfields and the McCoys. It was not a good thing to do. But geographically, if you remember, I showed you a couple months ago, it was really the only way to go. Otherwise, you had to go all of the way outside of Israel and up around to get to the northern part. As Jesus is approaching a village, he's met by 10 people who had leprosy. Now, leprosy is a disease mentioned frequently in the Bible and actually could have been used to describe a number of different skin ailments. So it's not just the kind of leprosy um, that we immediately think about when we hear that word. Leprosy was believed then to be a disease not just of the skin, but of the soul. It was often, often considered to be a punishment from God, and it was an especially tragic disease because it was so obvious for everyone to see. You can hide a stomach virus or a sinus infection, but you can't hide leprosy from your neighbor. So these factors meant that lepers were exiled from society. They were considered to be unclean. In fact, if a leper was approaching a crowded area, they were told they had to shout unclean to warn the people that they were coming. If they wanted to get someone's attention to ask for a handout, they had to shout from a distance so as not to contaminate the person that they were asking for help from. So that's what these ten lepers do when they see Jesus. Keeping their distance, they shout to him, asking for mercy. They don't ask to be healed because the idea of being cured was beyond their wildest dreams. They couldn't even imagine it. The title the lepers use, Master, was a common way of showing uh, respect. And their request to have mercy on us was simply a way of begging for money. They were not expecting a miracle. But that's what they get. Jesus commands them to go show themselves to the priests, an action that would be necessary for them to do before they could be considered clean and fit to return to society. And on the way to doing so, they are healed. One of the lepers turns back, praising God in a loud voice, throwing himself at Jesus' feet and offering thanks. And then Luke drops the bomb. Do you notice how he just kind of slides it in there? It says, and he was a Samaritan. For those who would have been listening around, watching the story, all of them would have known what Samaritans are like. Most of them would have been thinking, how can this be true? How could he be the hero of this story? I read this week one person's interpretation of why the other nine didn't express things, and I, I want you to hear it. Another pastor wrote it this way. The first was so happy he was healed that he simply forgot. The second was just following orders. He was determined to do what he was told by carrying out Jesus' command to see the priest. The third was too busy rushing off to be reunited with family and friends and to share the good news of his healing with others. The fourth leper, after years of suffering, felt he deserved something good to happen to him, and so he saw no need to offer thanks for it. The fifth was so overwhelmed by the miracle itself that he didn't pay attention to the one who provided it. 
The six just knew there was a logical explanation for the healing and that Jesus had nothing to do with it. The seventh leper, he was just plain frightened by what happened and frightened of Jesus. The eighth was secretly offended because Jesus took away his identity and he didn't know how to live life without leprosy. And as for the ninth leper, his life had been full of such misery and disrespect that he stopped saying thank you to anyone a long time ago. In our own lives, we can usually come up with at least nine different reasons why we don't stop and say thank you. But it is the tenth leper who must be our example. He, like the psalmist and like Paul, came to know how important giving thanks to God is in our lives. As I was preparing for this week's sermon, I was reminded once again that giving thanks in prayer is not just some kind of Pollyanna attitude or even an easy thing to do. Giving thanks to God in prayer isn't something we do just because it's nice or good or polite or even because it's our duty. And it's not something we need to do just when we're in a good mood or when things in our lives are going well. If we do it right, giving thanks radically changes our lives. And that's why we have to do it if we're going to grow in Christ. It's a new way of life, the core to the deeper, more spiritual life that all of us, in some way, are here seeking today. If giving thanks isn't something we do over and over, time and again, if it isn't a way of seeing the world that gets woven into the fabric of our lives, then we have missed the whole boat. The Greek word that's used in the scripture passage to convey giving thanks is one that might be familiar to you. It's a Greek word called eucharisto, giving thanks. Giving thanks is what we do each time we stand at the altar and share the Eucharist together. That's what Eucharist means, giving thanks. So here's how it changes us. When you give thanks to God, you have to fundamentally shift the focus away from just yourself, and you are brought to a place where you can get the broader perspective, where you can see the distance and the horizon. It's, I think, like standing on the ocean side and looking out at a distance, knowing that there's only vast water between you and the next continent over. I think that's what happened with the 10th leper. He was able to shift the focus away from his own happiness and to turn it back to the one who changed him. When you give thanks, you've stopped long enough to see what life is really all about, that it will be all right in the end. Giving thanks in prayer can change us. Now, sometimes it seems impossible to do this. Anne Lamott, the writer for whom we've uh, kind of taken a, an outline of this sermon series, says it this way. I admit sometimes this position of gratitude can be a bit of a stretch. So many bad things happen in each of our lives. Who knew? When my son Sam was seven and discovered that he and I would probably not die at the exactly the same moment, he began to weep and said to me, if I had known that, I wouldn't have agreed to be born. This one truth that the few people you adore will die is plenty difficult to absorb, but on top of it, someone's brakes fail or someone pulls the trigger or snatches the kid or someone deeply trusted succumbs to temptation and everything falls apart. We are hurt beyond any reasonable chance of healing. We are haunted by our failures and mortality. But then she says, the world keeps on spinning and in our grief, our rage and fear, a few people keep on loving us and showing up. In the face of everything, we slowly come through. We come to know or we connect with something rich and okay about ourselves. And at some point, we cast our eyes to the beautiful skies above all the stuff we're wallowing in and we whisper, thank you. In her book, Anne sees this gift of thank you as a way of reframing our situations, as a way of receiving a revelation from God in the midst of life. She says, thank you has a way of sweeping the sand off our feet. It allows us to move from a stuck place to a new place. It gives movement back to our living. For her, thank you is more than just saying words. It is a gateway, a way of being that creates an opening that God can enter in. Maybe this is a shift in attitude, one of receiving of grace or an increased sense of perspective. She again says it this way. Domestic pain can be searing and it is usually what does us in. It's almost indigestible. Death, divorce, old age, drugs, brain damaged children, violence, senility, unfaithfulness, good luck with figuring it out. 
It unfolds and you experience it, and it is so horrible and endless that you could almost give up a dozen times. But grace can be the experience of a second wind, when even though what you want is clarity and resolution, what you get is stamina and poignancy and the strength to hold on. Or you look at what was revealed in the latest mess and you say thanks for the revelation because it shows you some truth you needed to know. And that can be so rare in our families, let alone in our culture, in our world, and in our marriages, and in our relationships with our teenagers and with ourselves. You say thank you for lifting this corner of the curtain so I can see the truth, maybe just for a moment, in a way that might change my life forever. Friends, if we're lucky, and if we try really, really hard, giving thanks can become a habit in our lives. So as we end, I want to give you just a few ways to cultivate this kind of thankfulness in your prayer life so that you can be changed, as we have seen in scripture. First of all, I want to give you my own personal trick. This is my own personal trick for falling asleep at night. Has anybody in here ever experienced insomnia? Or am I the only one? Thank you. I'm not alone. It's nice to know. So I, uh, it runs in my family, and I frequently experience it. And so this is what I do. When I'm having trouble sleeping at night, I start a litany for myself. I say, thank you, God, for Dwight. Thank you, God, for that conversation I had today at the office. Thank you, God, for my mom. Thank you for my dad. Thank you for Ivy. Thank you for Amira. Thank you for Eva. On and on and on. And usually, by the time I've run out of things to say thanks for, I've fallen asleep. It's a wonderful way to fall asleep, and it's an even wonderful way to wake up in the morning. So that's my trick, trick for you. If you need to start practicing thankfulness, start trying to do it as you fall asleep. I have a friend who keeps a thankful stone in her pocket. Some people keep a worry stone. Do you know anybody who does that? Keeps one that they can kind of rub their fingers on? Yeah. My friend keeps what she calls a thankfulness stone in her pocket. And the way she uses it is that every time she touches it, she has to name something she's thankful for. So if you're someone who walks around with your hands in your pocket a lot, this is a really great practice for you. It would never work for me because I don't walk around like that. But if you walk around with hands in your pocket, find yourself a thankfulness stone, one that feels good, that you'll recognize against the coins and other things you have in your pocket. And each time you feel it, make yourself name something that you're thankful for. And here's my extra tip. Don't just name it in your head. Say it aloud. There is power in saying those kinds of things aloud. I'm also going to invite you to join me in trying something new, and that is actually sending the thank you cards that you write. So if you're like me and you have a hard time, maybe uh, you don't even get them or write them, but if you're like me and you get them and never send them, let's try sending them this week. I want you to find three people this week that you have something to say thank you to them for. Maybe it's something small, like they smiled at you and encouraged you. Maybe it's something big that they did a long time ago that you've never said thank you to them for. Find three people this week and either mail them a thank you card or pick up your phone and call them to say thank you. I think the more we do it, the easier it comes. Sometimes we have a hard time finding things to be thankful for in the midst of the difficult situations in our lives, and that's okay. Sometimes we need distance from the hard things in order to see where God is working in the midst of that. But if we cultivate that attitude of thankfulness early on in our prayer life, then the ability to see with those lenses comes much, much quicker when the hard days come. So this week, let us practice giving thanks. As a group, as individuals, let us turn our perspective, change our stance, so that we can turn our faces towards God in gratitude for all that he has done. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.